This paper is part of a, of a much larger project book, um, and it has all the scars of that, I'm afraid. So uh, the book is titled, at least provisionally, Relations of Production, uh, the Politics and Ontology of Trans Individuality. Um, so I want to start by, by sa just saying a little bit about this term, social individual, and I read a passage which maybe more or less functions as kind of the epigraph. Uh, and it's a quote from, from Marx. It's a quote from the Grundriss. And uh, in, in this quote, Marx writes, and he's describing what's happening as, as uh, knowledge becomes more and more of a directly productive force. And he says, uh, this is often the passage which is associated with this famous uh, phrase, the general intellect, which has got a lot of discussion in contemporary Marxism. But he also discusses the social individual in this section of these notebooks. And he says, quote, in this transformation, the worker is neither the direct human labor he himself performs, not the time during which he works, but rather the appropriation of his own general productive power, his understanding of nature and his mastery over it by virtue of his presence as a social body. It is, in a word, the development of the social individual, which appears as the great foundation stone of production and of wealth. So just to highlight a couple things in that, this is this idea of the social individual as both something which is produced, something that comes into existence through society and through social relations, but also something which also becomes itself, as he says, the great foundation stone of production and wealth. And this social individual involves both a relation to the overall knowledge in society, and it also involves a relation to, to nature as part of that. So to kind of unpack some of this notion of the social individual, I'm going to connect this to another philosophical term, a term that I've already sort of mentioned, define a little bit. And this term is trans-individuality, which comes from the work of uh, uh, relatively untranslated, as of yet, there's a stuff forthcoming, a philosopher by the name of uh, Gilbert Simondon. And um, what Gilbert Simondon wanted to stress is this idea that individuation had to be considered a process. Um, and, and, and a process in which, and he, he used this as a general sort of ontology. He wanted to talk about individuation, not just in terms of of human individuals, but in terms of physical individuation, in terms of and what eventually became psychic and what he called collective individuation. And as a process, individuation is something in which the uh, individuation always works from a set of what he called pre-individual conditions, or a, a, what he called a metastable state. And just to kind of illustrate how that would function at the level of, of individuals, what Simon Dome would stress is the way in which that we are all individuated physically, individuated um, as an organism. But that individuation is, to some extent, kind of incomplete. We have capabilities, we have drives, we have desires, but they're not yet entirely worked out how we're going to deal with all those drives and desires. So our... our sort of physical individuation functions as the raw material of our psychic individuation, because character or a personality is, to some extent, the formation of how we deal with all these drives, instincts, potentials, and possibilities, right? It is a, and it's an always incomplete process. And because of this, uh, and this is where trans-individuality comes into it, Simon Dunn stressed that the individuation of the uh, what he calls psychic individuation, the formation of a sense of self, subjectivity, etc., was always tied up with the individuation of and the constitution of some kind of collective, of an I which forms itself in relationship to a we. Um, and so, and what, just to sort of illustrate that briefly, if you think about, I mean, and this, and this goes against a long standing almost bias in political thought, in philosophy, in which we usually think of the relationship between the individual and the collective as a kind of zero-sum game, right? Either you, are, you enter into a group and you shed, you lose some of your individuality in entering that group, or you're an individual, in which case you can't enter into any sort of collective. Right? This, um, 
And, and Simondon thought that was exactly wrong in the sense that he thought that as you enter into a group, say, as you become, say, like a philosophy major, and you enter into a collective uh, philosophy department, you actually individuate yourself more so. You bring out parts of your subjectivity that were latent, that developed in relation to that. And that that group uh, becomes defined by your individuation in relation to it. it. It is transformed by your entry into it. So Simondon saw trans individuality as the way in which individuation is always part of the formation of both individuals and collectives. It's connected to this idea of social in, uh, individuals. So it's possible to understand Marx, I think, as a trans individual thinker. And this has drawn many Marxist, contemporary Marxist thinkers, such as Etienne Balibar, Paulo Virno, and Bernard Stingler, Stingler to this term. Um, to thinking about trans individuality in relation to Marx. However, I think that, that it's important to stress that Marx is what I'm going to call a critical trans individual thinker. And by that I mean that for him, trans individuality is not just a description of the way things are, that individuals are always constituting themselves in relation to collectives and vice versa, nor is it necessarily or exclusively a normative standard, although I do think that's part of Marx's normative uh, criteria, this idea of you know, the well-being of each and the well-being for all being usually constitutive. I think it's a critical concept because Marx is interested in the way in which at different points in time, individuation is constituted differently as a, as a history of, as a history of individuation as a sort of latent problematic in Marx's thought. And to illustrate that, I have another quote also from the Grundrisse. Um, this is from the its introduction. And Marx says in that passage, only in the 18th century, in civil society, do the various forms of social connectedness confront the individual as a mere means towards his private purposes, as external necessity. But the epoch which produces this standpoint, that of the isolated individual, is precisely that of the hitherto most developed social, from this standpoint, general, relations. The human being is, in the most literal sense, a political animal, not merely a gregarious animal, but an animal which can individuate itself only in the midst of society. So, what I mean by a critical thinker of trans individuality is that as much as Marx criticizes in that passage what he calls the Robinson Aids of political economy, their tendency to start from an isolated bourgeois subject as a starting point of history, which Marx argues has to be seen not as a starting point, but as its result, Marx doesn't criticize this in the sense of just opposing the way in which human beings actually are to this false conception, he wants to explain and give a genesis of how it comes to be that people see themselves as isolated, separate, not having any connections with other, and how this paradoxically takes place through the most developed relations, as he says. So my, my idea of Marx's sense of critique here is somewhat ironically drawn from the German ideology in the sense that in the German ideology, Marx doesn't just say that idealist conceptions of history are wrong. He tries to show, by stressing the division of mental and manual labor, how it is that we got to see the world so absolutely wrong and backwards to begin with. So critical has to contain, in this idea, a genesis of this misconceived idea. And to some extent, not just a genesis, but the way in which it functions. It is a reality. right? The, the bourgeois individual is not just an illusion, it is a reality. So what I want to do is uh, follow through some of Marx's, uh, some, some key but not, uh, not by all means all uh, in the short, in this time, text where Marx examines critically individuation. And the starting point I, th I feel has to be, despite all of the the, the problems with that text has to be uh, on the Jewish question. On the Jewish question, obviously, is not the polemic is not 
explicitly, directly concerned with uh, the question of individuation. But in that text, um, Marx begins to describe the way in which, uh, as he sees at least 19th century political life, involving this odd split, an odd split which uh, stems from what he sees as the, uh, uh, the, the relationship between the state and civil society, drawing these terms primarily from Hegel's understanding of them. But what, first what Marx does critically in that text is argues that when the state, as it did in sort of the bourgeois revolutions, declare dimensions of birth, rank, education, and occupation irrelevant, it didn't so much do away with these. It only emancipated man from these things politically, which means to some extent that the state declares that it no longer matters who your parents were, what part of society you were born into, but those differences, those differences of wealth and rank continue to have their effects within society. It just, they no longer have official political standing. The law is indifferent to them. And uh, so this creates this odd duality in, in political life, which Marx describes as follows. Where the political state has attained its full development, man leads not only in thought, consciousness, but in reality, in life, a double existence, celestial and terrestrial. He lives in the political community where he regards himself as a communal being and in civil society where he acts simply as a private individual, treats other men as means, degrades himself to the role of a mere means, and becomes the plaything of alien powers. The political state in relation to civil society is just as spiritual as in heaven in relation to earth, right? So that what Marx sees is a, a sort of schizophrenic split in 19th century society, which one argue continues, although I want to trace how this split continues, in which there is a kind of um, duality between mankind's life in civil society, and civil society is what will eventually become Marx's understanding of capitalism, but here he doesn't, hasn't yet developed that, and it's life of private interest, life divided in terms of hierarchies and divisions and competition, but then there is also one's political life, one's life as a citizen in which one participates in this spiritual community in which is, one is concerned with the general well-being and so on. Uh, and as Marx indicates with his suggestion of religion, because this is also the time being in which he wrote the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, in which he argued, you know, the, everyone remembers the, the, the line about uh, religion being the opiate, but no one remembers the line after that where he talks about it being the heart of a heartless world, and he traces the desire for religion from the divisions, antagonisms, and inequalities in society. And the same thing happens now, it happens at the level of the state. So there's, first in this text, there's a split, but then split between civil society and political life. But then Marx goes on to argue that it's actually much worse than that. That what happens is not so much um, a split, but this political life becomes in the service of, 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 of private, self-interested life. And, and Marx does this, this critical reading in that text of this sort of foundational uh, text of, of modern democracy, uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, in which he shows that at each stage of the way, uh, the various rights that are being described in terms of their protection of life, liberty, property, and security are actually the rights of an individual who's radically separated from others, who only pursues his own interest, that, that the political citizen becomes sort of just the handmaiden of the private, egotistical individual. Um, and he says, or, actually, I'm not going to read that quote because I just said that. Um, so in this early text, and this is 1843, I think we get, we get what I see as the three component elements of Marx's understanding of this problem of individuation. First, 
and most obviously, we get the critique of the private, egotistical, self-interested individual. But also, and just as important, I think, we get the critique of the state as, at best, a false universal, a universal which only exists in this heaven and doesn't really relate to our individual lives, the sort of idea that you know, one day out of the year you go in a voting booth and that day of the year you're a citizen and you're concerned with the welfare of the nation, but 364 days of the year you're struggling with your own private interest. So there's a critique of the state as, as at best a kind of false idea, but at worst a kind of universal which is always subordinated to particular interests. Right? That this is a mass for these particular interests. So the, there's a critique both of the individual and an empty universal, but there is also, and the third term which sort of connects these two is that is the idea that this division and how it plays itself out relates to uh, what Marx calls in this early text at least civil society, um, but he'll eventually develop into the critique of capitalism. Because in this, in this early text, Marx juxtaposes what he calls um, political emancipation, the emancipation in which the state emancipates us from our uh, rank, property, etc., cetera, and, and human emancipation. And he says human emancipation can only take place when our collective life becomes a direct day-to-day -day concern. And he invokes species being. Um, and I just... I'm so now I want to explore these, the way these three terms, or maybe four, play out in later texts, the three terms being critique of, of isolated individual, the, uh, the critique of the false universal, and um, the tied to the critique of political economy, and with them the idea of another possibility. I mean, species being this, this sort of text, you know, famously from 1844, um, where, where Marx talks about the idea that human beings relate not just to their own self-interest, but to the self-interest of the entire species, right? We create things which aren't just for my use, oops, uh, but the use of uh, other species would create, you know, works of art, buildings, etc., that relate to the entire species. And he also ties that to, I think quite importantly, species being in the early text is tied to the idea that we human beings relate to all of nature. Right? The stars above are part of our, our, our work, part of our things we reflect on, part of the things we create in relation to. He's, he's juxtaposing this to a sort of more limited idea of animal existence, which, you know, you know, the beaver relates only to, to wood and water, and that's pretty much all it's interested in. Uh, it doesn't contemplate the starry skies above or uh, the worms beneath the ground. But human beings relate to all of nature. So there's a sense of species being both a relation to the species and a relation to, to nature, which is important to stress because also in that text, we begin to get the, the early critique of private property, where Marx says, uh, private property has made us so stupid and one-sided that an object is only ours once we have it. The idea that there's not just an alienation of species being in work as we are forced to take our capacities to, inter to interrelate to all of human species and all of nature into a job which strips us down to a repetitive, you know, almost animalistic existence that becomes repetitive, doing the same thing, interacting with the world in the same rigid way again and again and again. But there's also a sense in there that there's an alienation in consumption as well, that as we consume things, we, we relate to the world only insofar as it's something we can possess, losing some of that, that large sense of species being. Okay, so to move onward, uh, briefly and quickly through, through Marx and follow this critique of individuation. We get in, in, in Capital, in the volume one of Capital, we get a very strong and polemical statement about uh, individuation once again. And this is in the passage where Marx has actually has looked at and examined what he calls the sphere of circulation the exchange of commodities for money. And he's begun to realize or point out that 
the secret of capital can't necessarily be found in that sphere. But he does, before he leaves us and moves into what he calls the hidden abode of production, he gives us a description of the way in which the sphere of circulation exists, but also the way in which it has within it its own idea of social relations and its own idea of the individual. And Marx writes in that passage, uh, the sphere of circulation or commodity exchange within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. It is the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, and Bentham. Freedom, because both buyer and seller of a commodity, let us say of labor power, are determined by their own free will. They contract as free persons who are equal before the law. The only force bringing them together and putting them into relation with each other is the selfishness, the gain, and private interests of each. So there's a lot in that passage that repeats the sort of critique of the bourgeois individual from earlier, except and this is an important difference, Marx now associates that bourgeois individual with the sphere of circulation. Because he's going to point out that the sphere of circulation is not the entirety of um, economic life. And that it also has to be set up against what he calls the sphere of production. Um, and the sphere of production is defined not by freedom, equality, and Bentham, but it is, as Slavoj Žižek argues, the exception that proves that rule. It is defined by asymmetry, which detailing these asymmetries makes up most of, of capital. Um, and in fact, Marx illustrates this, this asymmetry by saying at the end of that passage um, that the worker has brought his own hide to the market and now has nothing to ex expect but a hiding. Right? He talks about a, a change happens over our conceptual persona. They're no longer equals within the sphere of, of self-interested motivation, but now one strides forward as the capitalist and the other slinks back as the worker. And this difference, which has to do with the difference of the exchange of a, this unique commodity called labor power, right? which is the commodity that has different rules, although these rules are not radically different from the rules of, of uh, exchange in general. As Marx points out, that uh, the worker is selling his or her labor power uh, and is, as in the case of all selling, trying to get the best deal for this sale. And the, the capitalist, to use his conceptual persona, is buying labor power and is trying to get the most out of what he's buying. Um, and as, so as Marx says, there is here an antinomy of right against right, both equaling the seal of the law of exchange between equal rights, force decides. So force and asymmetry enters into the equation now but it enters into, to some extent, by the rules of commodity exchange itself. The only difference being the commodity being exchanged now is labor power, is one's life and one's capacity to work, um, in which there's a tension now between, of course, the capitalist trying to get the most out of this, the worker trying to, to get more for it or be able to save more of it, because Marx points out one of the big conflicts is that in capitalism is that the capitalist can use up a worker leave him or her hobbled and broken by the labor process and always find another one, right? So the, the sale is not just, a sale maybe over this time for this amount of time that defines the wage relation, but that sale affects the worker's entire life. So we have in Marx the idea that, that, that the sphere of circulation gives us this idea of freedom, equality, and Bentham, as he says, it. freedom, equality, and self-interest, right? And this idea, underwrites, to some extent, a lot of the ideologies, I think, of the free market, where we think of the market as being one where two equals meet each other, one trying to buy, one trying to sell. But Marx is pointing out that that, that equality has to be read in light of this fundamental asymmetry that defines the labor process. And it's not necessarily, because Marx is a thinker of class struggle, it's not necessarily, it's an asymmetry of force, 
it's not necessarily one in which the capitalist always has the advantage. It depends on so many other factors of organization and, and so on and so forth. Um, but this difference between equality on the one hand and force on the other hand uh, does not, of course, exhaust the, the difference between these two spheres of production, both of which I'm now saying have their own trans-individual individuation. Um, Marx also talks a lot about how it is in the sphere of circulation that I can see myself as detached from others. And, and Marx is very interested in this in terms of the question of money in society. Money makes it possible for me to have relations with others that are not based upon my qualities, attributes, and so on, but are simply based on how much money I have. Right? Marx says, also in the Grundrisse, with money, the individual carries his social bond in his pocket, in the sense that I, have to, I no longer have to be, uh, possess certain qualities for people to treat me a certain way. If I have money, they'll treat me a certain way, regardless of whether or not I have these qualities. Um, so there is also, I think, in this uh, another dimension of this different individuation, and this is also from Capital. This is a long passage I want to talk about for a little bit. Um, and this is the, the passage where Marx talks about cooperation. He says, Marx says, uh, whether the combined working day in a given, given case acquires this increased productivity because it heightens the mechanical force of labor or extends the sphere of action over a greater space or contracts the field of production relatively to the scale of production uh, or at the critical moment sets large masses of labor to work or excited rivalry between individuals and raises their animal spirits or impresses on the similar operations carried on by a number of men, the stamp of continuity and many sideness or performs different operations simultaneously or economizes the means of production by use in common. Whichever of these is the cause of the increase, the special productive power of the combined working day is under all circumstances the social productive power of labor or the productive power of social labor. This power arises from cooperation itself. When the worker cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capabilities of his species, Gattung's Vermogen. So it's connected very tightly to this idea of species being. Um, so Marx is basically saying that when we work in cooperation, and cooperation is one of the forces that capitalism uses in the factory in the call center, throughout society. Something happens which is more than the sum of individual parts. It's more than just add the productive power of this person plus the productive power of this person and so on. There is this surplus of cooperative activity. And Marx, he gives in that long passage, you know, he's not quite sure where this comes from. He says it might come from the animal passions, it might come from competition, like people trying to out, out beat each other each other, he's relatively indifferent to it, but it is this social surplus. Though the one thing that Marx is very clear in on capital is that this surplus becomes a surplus which capital takes all the credit for. Because it doesn't appear, right, because a bunch of people go into work, or an entire society goes to work, and doesn't necessarily see the way in which their, their relations in work involve a different collectivity, a different individuation than that of the market, it appears as if capital itself is this magical, mystical force creating wealth and generating things. And this is, I think, tightly tied to uh, passages which are you know, perhaps more familiar, Marx's discussion of, of um, commodity fetishism and so on. Um, because, right, as Marx says in commodity fetishism, a social relation between men appears as a relation between things. Right? That productive force of cooperation doesn't appear to be something that the workers have together. It appears as something that exists in the product or in capital. So there's a certain sense in which I, I think that in, in capital, at least, or in this, these later writings, Marx gives us a different understanding of the way individuation plays itself out in capitalism. It's not just a, a critic, critique of the isolated bourgeois individual. First, it points out that that 
that image is produced by the sphere of what he calls circulation, the sphere of the market, and it is produced by that exchange, but that, that does not exhaust economic activity. There is production, which brings with it both inequality and, uh, and with it this cooperative individuation, which to some extent um, doesn't appear. Marx even talks about how this, this cooperative power, and he, in, these, in these later passages, um, like the, the unpublished results of the immediate process of production, Marx even very explicitly says, the more and more cooperative and social labor becomes, the more it utilizes things like the knowledge of society. Because Marx is also pointing out that the knowledge of society is also something which is to some extent never really bought. Um, because that knowledge, the knowledge of the social individual, it often relates to the way in which uh, people pick up skills and knowledges, not even, and Marx even stresses this, not even during the time of work or their formal academic training. Right? I mean, the, the, the joke I always make about this is that perhaps, you know, when you're on Facebook, you're learning more about, about your contemporary labor process than you than you know, right? You're learning how to, to multitask, to constantly update, to concern yourself with your image and appearance. So that, that becomes, to some extent, when you take that, all that, into the workplace, that becomes part of your existence as a social individual. It becomes part of this, this cooperative excess that is, that is part of capital, but appears, as Marx says, as a free gift to capital. Um, so, so Marx, so I want to say a little bit about, about in closing this, about where this might relate, this is all from the 19th century, uh, where this all relates now. Um, so, contemporary capitalism, what some would call real subsumption, I think can be defined as an increased exploitation of the trans individual. In other words, it is increasingly not so much the work of one hand or one mind that is put to work, but it is increasingly the work of what Marx calls a social individual or this, the general intellect, the knowledge of society that is increasingly put to work. Social cooperation itself is increasingly put to work. So contemporary capitalism could be defined as the increased exploitation of the trans individual and the increased commodification of uh, what could be called the pre-individual. By the pre-individual, I mean the elements, the language, the habits, the affects, the sensibility that defines my individuation. Right? That much of what forms the, 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 the backdrop of my existence comes to, my, to me in a thoroughly commodified form. All my memories are memories of TV shows, and all my, uh, all my desires are desires which have been marketed to me, and so on. Um, so this, to some extent, deepens that paradox that Marx described in the opening of the Grundrisse, in which the most developed social relations become the most isolated individuals. Uh, never have human beings been more social in their existence, but more individualized, privatized in the, in the apprehension of their existence. On the one hand, the simplest action from making a meal to writing an essay engages the labor of individuals around the world, materializing commodities, habits, and machines, while on the other, there's a tendency to transform everything, every social relation, into something that can be purchased as a commodity. Uh, so this is a deepening of this paradox that Marx defined in the Grundrisse. Um, the materialization of collective intelligence in machines produces new effects of isolation, uh, to quote Hart and Negri, individualizing social actors in their separate automobiles and in front of separate video screens. Trans individual relations, the cooperation of multiple minds, bodies and machines produce individual and isolated perception. So, I mean, those, those little examples like the automobile, the laptop, I think, are good illustrations of this. With the automobile, when you drive your automobile, it's an incredibly 
There's all the social labor in the car itself. There's the highways and the road systems, which you tend to forget about, which, without which the car would be relatively useless. Uh, but it is all apprehended as an incredibly isolated uh, experience uh, in which you're engaged, your relation to other individuals is one of competition. You know, how dare you cut me off? I'm going to drive through here and so on. Uh, so it is, it is a, a massive social process which appears as a highly individualized experience. In fact, some thinkers in this tradition, even uh, uh, like Bernard Stigler, will argue that these, these things like um, automo driving an automobile, watching television by yourself, cruising the internet, make possible neither a we, neither a collective, because you're not a group in the way in which if you got on a bus, you would be with those bunch of people as to some extent a collective, right? You see that happens if the bus breaks down, suddenly people start talking to each other and they relate in a way they hadn't before. But on the highway, you're not, you're not a collective, you're not we highway drivers, uh, but nor, uh, Stigler would argue, nor are you really individuated in the sense that that the highway driving just produces this generic experience, which is neither like a unique experience, unless something like unless you hit a deer or something, nothing happens on that drive which really is going to define or individuate you, make something like that can happen, right? That that that, and the same is true for for like going on, online, where you're only a collective in the sense of some algorithm that Google has of of hits and so on. You're not a collective in any real meaningful sense. Right? You're, you're constantly being collectivized and collected, and, 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 but it's not a collective that you can identify with or relate to. And to some extent, you know, it's also not individuated because it is incredibly generic. Right? It's, it's, you can't call watching the same program that millions of other people are watching at different TV screens in different places a unique and individual experience. So uh, Bernard Stiegler, who's taken this idea of trans-individuality in relation to capitalism in a, in a, in a somewhat uh, dismal direction, argues that, 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 that there is in all these things neither a we nor an I. Um, but I think, I think, and this defines what I think is the, the sort of contemporary um, problem of, of individuation and collectivity in capitalism. I think on the one hand we have the idea that we could, without transforming the way in which we're individuated, still have something like meaningful social change and interaction. I think this is why people are, are obsessed with fantasies of sort of the, the Twitter revolution, the Facebook revolution, et cetera. This idea that I can have an uh, impact on society without ever having to leave that little screen, without ever having to talk to anyone else, without ever having to put myself out there, I can begin to have, right? I just have to know what the hashtag for the day is that is going to cause the maximum effect, right? I just have to know which, which uh, current cause I should make my, my um, profile picture on Facebook, and I will have a social effect without ever transforming this individual. And of course, the other flip side of this is, and it's been going on since the beginning of capital itself, is the nostalgia for some kind of true community. Um, and I think neither of these, to some extent, really work. Uh, the first, because I think that social action requires social relations, and a transformation of social relations it requires solidarity. Secondly, with respect to the nostalgia for community, I think this then overlooks something I haven't really talked about enough here, and that is the, the positive relationship between capitalism and uh, collectivity or trans-individual individuation. And that is, and I'm thinking here of the passages in, in the Communist Manifesto most strikingly, where Marx talks about capitalism you know, destroying all feudal patriarchal relations, all holies profaned, and so on. I think that, that for a long time, people have treated the conditions of their individuation, the culture they were born into, the language they spoke, as something which is thoroughly naturalized or God-given. In capitalism, we, I think, understand in a way, I think we have to tap into, that the basis of our language, our knowledge, etc., are not of our culture, of our belonging, of our solidarities, are not natural. They are produced. They're often produced in ways that I think sort of 
alienate us from our ability to interact with that production because we buy our social belonging in the form of the brands we wear and so on. But they're not natural. And that, I think Marx wanted to harvest the, 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 uh, the positive nature of that. And I think that any political project would have to do that. So the task then is to produce a society that is neither the fragmenting of individuality, these sort of impossible individualities of the, of the driving down the highway or in front of the TV screen, or a totality of the, against the individual, some nostalgic new community, but one in which trans individuality is an active production, not an ossified tradition or an indifferent market. And that is, I think, the task of a contemporary Marxist politics. Thank you. Uh, by uh, something that you said near the end of your presentation about Facebook and Twitter and uh, the recent uh, enthusiasm surrounding these things. And I don't want to sort of come off as a defender of, of Facebook, but it seems that um, y you were suggesting that there is a kind of impoverishment of uh, political potentials because of the sort of trajectory of individuation that these new technologies presents. And that seems to presuppose, uh, you said at some point that that uh, sort of uh, um, undermines uh, meaningful social relations. And I was wondering, first of all, it seems that that presupposes a, no, a, a notion of society and a notion of meaning that I, I'm not sure, I would like to know more about what they are and why they are in some way mutually exclusive or in tension with the kinds of, uh, say, activities or modes of relation that are uh, made possible with these new social networking technologies. Um, so I'll just, I'll just stop there for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't... I I said that as, a, as an example. I, I don't entirely, I mean, I'm, I, I still think the, for me right now, the, the debate around social media and political change, I think, is, is an interesting debate, right? On the one hand, you have people saying that, that, that these, and they, and they, I think, want to too readily attribute, say, Arab Spring and all these transformations to, oh, well, people could connect and they could talk, and this is media, it's not controlled by the state or, or major corporations, you can post whatever. And then there are other people who point out, you know, well, you know, things only really started to happen once Egypt shut down social media, once people actually were in a square and they were suddenly interacting across lines of, of class and even, even religious belonging and, and, and so on, and that you still need that good old fashioned solidarity to really do anything. Um, and I think I see those as kind of the, the, the two sides of a certain kind of dialectic. Um, one saying you need, you know, good old fashioned solidarity, the other one saying that we have new kinds of social connection which make possible new kinds of social transformation. And I, I find myself both, both philosophically and personally sort of torn between both those, both those arguments and trying to think through uh, the relations between them. Um, but I, I do think that, that Facebook works as an, as an illustration of um, what what I think is, I mean, the, the character people have of Facebook of right is like you go on Facebook and you see tons of people saying completely boring things about their personal lives that you never wanted to hear, anyways. And it's neither sort of like individuating in a in a in a strong sense of the of of the way in which you know if someone actually reflected and thought and wrote, you might have like oh wow you're really expressing something there, but like. Uh, you know, worst sandwich ever as a status update is not is neither particularly interesting nor 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 compelling. Um, and so, I mean, I'm torn between. Uh, in, in the later version of this, I kind of take as 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 the two perspectives on the relationship between individuation and, and sort of technology to be on the one hand Bernard Stiegler, who I think is sometimes sounds like he's trying to out Adorno, Adorno, in a sort of apocalyptic sort of sense of like, we, there's neither an I nor a we, there's just this sort of pointless, uh, you know, this, all this communicating which is not communicating, all this, this, this disindividuation, you just become a set of drives that are marketed and sold to and so on. But then on the other side is, is the work of Paulo Vierna, who I think is much more optimistic about this sort of technology and says, you know, we have here is the formation of what he calls a non-state public sphere. That, that people are, uh, it's, a, it's a, a public sphere which exists not in control of any states, and states struggle with this. Both across the world and now in the U.S., disturbingly so. Right there was, 
attempts to see if you could shut down social media, well, first in the UK, shutting down the, the cell phone use and, on BART in San Francisco, right? There's the police coming in and shutting these things down because of their organizing potential. Uh, but but, but what Virno really stresses is that we have become, I mean, he's working against the older rent model. And he says, to some extent, we're more of labor versus action. And he says, we become so much more communicative in our work rather than in our, in our action. Right? We all communicate at work. We all communicate in our consumption, really. And those potentials are, are real potentials which could be, be utilized. And so I see that side as well. Um, but I do think that, that the, I do take seriously the idea that any social transformation is a transformation of individuation. You're in a, a very conservative state, and uh, if, if these folks saw the title of your presentation, particularly Tea Party folks, then they'd stay away in droves. They'd think that this was going to be a, a rather, you know, something that would offend their politics, their economics, their, you know, overall social life. But for me, I think everything that you've said would be in agreement with uh, Tea Party folks. I mean, I think they can find so much in what you would, what you have just said, in uh, what they've been trying to accomplish. Um, can can you give those of us who are um, of your thinking some some hope for the future? Because this is a real Tea Party state. I do think. I mean, I think this is, this is a big question. I think that there is in 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 Tea Party politics and lots of politics, there is a um, nostalgia for community, right? I mean, there is, to some extent, a resistance against, um, against a certain type of fragmentation and in, in individuation, although it would never be formulated in these terms, right? It would never be formulated in terms of capital. It would never be formulated in these terms. And, and, and so the question is both, well, what, I think that, that difference is a big difference. Um, and, and also, I think the other important thing is that, and, and it's something that I'm trying to guard against in this project, is, is I think every cr criticism of sort of fragmentation, isolation, et cetera, has to guard itself against its own tendency for nostalgia right? and, and its own tendency for some idea of social belonging, social cohesiveness. And I think to some extent, in, in broad outlines, I think the general Marxist critique is right in that, on the one hand, um, it's a rejection of the fragmentation and isolation, but it's also, I think, in its best formulations, without nostalgia for some kind of belonging that would be based on a sense of, of, of nation, a sense of race, a sense of linguistic community, and so on, that, that, that at a core, I think, a liberatory project has to take into consideration the fact that we create and are created by the conditions of our own collective and individual formation. Right? And, and, and working through that both simultaneously, being created and creating these things, I think, is the task of politics and is the task of of economics, and I think both the Tea Parties and the left are aware of, on some fundamental existential level, the fact that we don't have a lot of control of the conditions of both of our, of our collective and individual uh, formation. Right? Those things are outside of our control. Right? That there's a big difference and a big disagreement about where we understand, you know, and the, and the split between um, between seeing the culprit as being capital or the state or government or whatever, but there's an underlying basic, at the core there's a basic existential similarity. We don't control the conditions of our, of our, of our individuation. Um, but I also think that part of the use of this idea of trans individuality is that so often we tend to think of the relationship between the collective and the individual as, as I said, a sort of zero-sum game. Right? I, think it's, I think it's a law, it's an effect of what uh, Alberto Toscano calls somewhere philosophy's long cold war. Or the, the tendency to, to, to inscribe concepts of individual, connect them with, with liberty, and concepts of collectivity, connect them with equality, and see them as, as mutually exclusive. 
And I think that, that a lot of conceptual, philosophical, and political work needs to be done to unravel that, that, that knot. Um, and, and that's my interest in this, in this project. How has this affected your life personally in terms of how you live your life, uh, this academic discussion that you're having? Well, it has not caused me to leave Facebook despite what I said. Um, but, uh, um, well, I think, I think it's a good question. And good question being that thing people always say to stall answering a difficult question. Uh, I think that, that it, has, um, it has made me more aware uh, of the way in which um, I mean, just on a on a just an immediate level. I mean, I think I think I think maybe we should be more puzzled by the way in which, in our contemporary society, we um, we individuate ourselves or isolate ourselves in strange ways. I mean, I had to, I got here from Portland, Maine. I had to get here from two flights. And flying is this bizarre thing where you know, in a modern coach airplane, you are so close to another human being, but you spend most of your time completely ignoring. Are you, you, you completely ignoring that that proximity, right? Uh, and and it's a strange. It's a, and I and I take this to be not just something one can sort of criticize, but I take this the way in which we are individuated through our habits and through our practices. And our habits and practices make us very good at um, this sort of what 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 some call this sort of idea of gregarious isolation, right? The, the sort of, the, the, the sort of what I call the highway experience of being involved in the same process but not seeing other people as, any, as anything other than sort of either in different numbers in that process or as hostile objects within that, within that process, right? As people in your way and causing you to, you know. And so I think that, that, that um, one has to be attentive to the way in which uh, the practices, because I think I don't think Marx thought when he was talking about a critique of, of bourgeois isolation, he didn't think this as kind of just a fiction or just like a bad idea people have. He thought this to be an actual practice, right? Even back in the, in the Jewish question, he says both in consciousness and in reality, we have this duality of our lives, the life of a private individual in our day-to-day -day lives and the lives of a collective individual in our political lives. Right? So he didn't think this is just being a fiction we could dispel. Right? I think this is, maybe we should say more about this, I think this is the tension between thinking Marx in relation to ethics because Marx sees these individuations not just as something one could freely choose, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to decide to be more altruistic, gregarious, etc. But Marx, I mean, that's too idealistic from Marx. Marx would take seriously the way in which, in our day-to-day -day actions, we are uh, individuated in such a way where we uh, see we separate ourselves from other human beings. We use money as that social bond, right? You walk up and you say, you know, behind a counter, there's another human being there. You're not really, whatever. You, give them, you get the goods, you give them the money. That's the extent of your relation. That's all you, all you need to know from them. They, a machine could replace them and that would work just as well, as long as it didn't have one of those annoying, you know, bill feeders that kept spitting the dollar back out at you. It would work just as well. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think the practices that individuate us have to be taken in seriously as constitutive, we should be critical of them, but recognize that if we want different social relations, we need different practices as well. That's something that I try to think about.